Welcome. We are so thankful that you have joined with us to watch this message. We pray it will be a blessing to you, that we'll all learn from it, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in watching the message at this time. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus and his disciples had just crossed the Sea of Galilee from Israel on the east side, and they headed west to the side of the Gerasenes, the Decapolis. The area of the Gentiles, pagans, people that did not worship the Lord God, rather they worshipped deities. So let's uh, explain this a little bit. Uh, Jesus' disciples were uncomfortable. They had just come from the crossing of the Sea of Galilee. They got caught in a squall, a storm on the sea. The sea was tossing the boat around, so they were concerned that they were going to get swamped and drowned. Jesus is asleep in the boat through this, so he must have been exhausted from his teaching. And they woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? So Jesus got up and he calmed the storm. So you can imagine that the disciples are a little bit rattled but they would also be rattled because of where they were going because you just don't go over to this area of the Gerasenes on the, west, or on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. When they arrived, this man came up to Jesus and fell on his knees. Now we need to describe this man. He was a demon-possessed man. He lived in the tombs. In other words, that would be like living in the cemetery today. They had tried to contain him by putting chains on him, and he would break the chains off. They put him in leg irons. He broke the leg irons off. This guy was strong, or we should say that the demons were strong. He cut himself with rocks. And the Bible says that he would scream day and night from the tombs. So I want you to just imagine that if you lived someplace near a cemetery and it's nighttime and middle of the night you're hearing screams coming from the cemetery. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me that, that makes chills go up and down my spine. It makes the hair on the back of my neck start to stand up. Not the most comfortable thing. So here we have the disciples that were uncomfortable going over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. They were uncomfortable because of the storm on the sea. Uh, they really didn't want to go where they were going. And now you get there and all of what you've got this, this madman coming up to you. Uh, my guess is their stomachs were churning. And I can halfway imagine because a few years ago when we went to Haiti, I was not prepared for third world poverty of that extent. And for the first two, three days, my stomach churned. I just, I was out of my element. Just, I wasn't comfortable until we finally took a hike to a church up in the hills or mountains, or whatever they call them. And, and because I'm a country boy, I, I finally got comfortable. But it took a while. So I can imagine what the disciples were thinking and what they were going through during this time. So they arrive on the banks. This guy comes up to them and and falls on his knees. In Mark chapter 5 verse 7. He shouted at the top of his voice. What do you want with me Jesus. Son of the most high God. In God's name don't torture me. Can you imagine this? Now the disciples are really nervous. Now this isn't even about the disciples. I just want to put you there. So that you can understand the horror of this situation to the disciples. But yet this is Jesus' intention. This is why Jesus crossed the sea. So Jesus told the demons to leave the man. Did they leave? Well, no. They started a conversation. Jesus asked the demons, what's your name? They said, legions. Because we are many. And then they told Jesus, said, don't cast us out of the area. Well, they didn't tell him, they asked him. But can we go into this herd of swine? There was a 
herd of swine nearby, around 2,000 according to what Mark says. And Jesus said, go ahead. So they left this demon-possessed man. They went into this herd of swine, 2,000 of them. And when they entered the swine, the swine went berserk, ran down a steep embankment of the Sea of Galilee into the sea and drowned. Now you have 2,000 dead hogs floating in the Sea of Galilee, starting to bloat as animals do once they die. Quite a scene. Formerly demon-possessed man, now he's sanely talking to Jesus. Swine rotting in the sea. And with that, the people that was taking care of the swine, they left the scene, headed back to town, through the countryside, telling everyone what they had just seen and what happened. Now, let's pause just a little bit. I don't know if you've been around hogs, swine, pigs, whatever you want to call them or not, but hogs are basically four-legged garbage cans. Their mouths are always chewing on something. They, they, they eat everything that's edible and maybe even some things that aren't edible. When I was on the farm, I raised cattle and I raised hogs. And I always made a comment, especially since I had heart problems. If I ever have a heart attack, I hope I have a heart attack in the cattle pen and not the hog pen, simply because if I dropped over in the steers, they'd probably push me around with their heads, they'd butt me around, they'd step on me and whatever else. But I'd be fairly recognizable. Not if you die. Not if you die in the hog pen. The hogs will tear you to pieces. They'll chew on you. They'll nibble you. They'll bite from you. And you may not even be recognizable. The reason I'm saying this is because the hogs are four-legged garbage cans. In other words, I heard two different ideas on this. That is that the hogs, this herd of swine, was probably the city dump. This was the city sanitation system. Got extra garbage, got bones, Take it out to the herd of swine. They will clean it up. Seriously. Good chance of that. This last week, I also discovered another aspect of this. And this is that uh, an expert on Israelite history and the history of the region said that that the Gerasenes, the Decapolis people, had deities. And one of those deities was swine. Pigs. As a false God. Now think about this again with the disciples. They didn't want to go there. They'd cross the sea in a storm. Jesus calmed the storm. They'd go there. they meet this guy. And now they got these pigs. Pigs and Israelites didn't go together because God says you don't eat pigs. They didn't keep them around. Everything that these disciples were uncomfortable with, Jesus was throwing at them. There was a lesson here for the disciples, I'm sure, but that's not the focus of where we're going. So now you got these swine, that's the city garbage dump, the swine that is the deity of the people, and they're gone. They're dead. You think they were upset? Yeah, they were. The people were terrified. And they literally pleaded with Jesus, just please leave us. Go away. We don't want you here. Let's pause our story here. Good morning. A little bit different of an introduction this morning. So glad you're here. Welcome to the live stream. And this this is a little bit different. This is the second message of our series of God, the master artist. And today we're looking at blank canvases. We have a blank canvas up here this morning. Last week we started this talking about God, the creator, master creator. And we learned that he created everything out of nothing. And we didn't just use one verse. We used at least two verses, two extra ones. And there were more verses in the Bible that I could have pulled out and we could have spent time on that confirm God Our creator created from nothing. That means no Big Bang Theory. That means no theory of evolution. 
And, you know, I don't know why, you know, even I get caught up in this, I don't know why we think that we've got to come up with a solution to the creation when scientists and, and skeptics say, well, God couldn't have created it from nothing. Well, why not? Do we believe that Jesus healed the paralytic, the blind, just by telling him, you're okay? Do we believe that? Do we believe that Jesus raised from the dead? Yeah. So why do we have a hard time believing that God could create everything from nothing? It's all in the same category. We don't try to explain away his miracles, so why do we try to explain his creation? The Bible says from nothing. So we establish that God's the master creator, but we also establish that God's the master artist because we said that there's different forms of art. We used an example, a, a body shop that takes a wrecked car and, and restores it to showroom quality. That's an art. I've seen some people do it, and it's not an art. But some people really do it neat. And there's different things that we do. Whatever you do in your profession or whatever you do in your hobby, if you're, if you're at expert level, you're really an artist at what you're doing there. So we have a God, the God, that's the master artist that created everything from nothing. And this is our point this morning, that God wants us as blank canvases. Because God wants to work with a clean slate in our lives. We have this tripod here this morning. We have a canvas on it. Too many times you and I do our painting and we mess it up. God wants a clean canvas so that he can work. So that he can do the creations for us and what we should be, not what we want to be. So now we go back to this incident of the demon-possessed man. Jesus cast a demon out of him and we can imagine, think about the, the canvas of this demon-possessed man. Number one, he probably started painting a dark painting to a even allow the demons to come into him. And once the demons were in him, they were painting an even darker, more terrifying picture. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes along, casts the demons out of the man, and almost the man's got a blank canvas. Why does God want a blank canvas? Because he's got a plan for our life. He's got things that he wants to do with us. He says, you've messed it up. I've messed it up. Canaan Raider has messed it up. God says, I can really paint a masterpiece in your life if you just let me. God wants to paint his masterpiece in our lives. Now, how do we explain this? Well, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, we were in Jeremiah last week. So let's go back at least to start with. In this area of Jeremiah... Jeremiah is telling the people that God, God has told you for centuries to follow him, to obey him. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel is gone way, way long time ago. So all that's left is the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. But they kept disobeying God also. And God says, look, if you don't repent, I'm going to wipe you out. And so the day had finally come that God let King Nebuchadnezzar Babylon to build up power. They came down. They invaded Judah, Jerusalem. They destroyed the city, destroyed everybody. They hauled the Israelites from Jerusalem back to Babylon. And God told them, he said, okay, now you're going to be there for the next 70 years. I want you to settle in. I want you to raise families. I want you to marry. I want you to have kids, get jobs, just settle in. Because you're going to be there for 70 years. And then after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. So we go to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you declares the Lord. 
And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. What was God doing here? He wanted a blank canvas. The Israelites had painted such a dark, horrible canvas of their lives. Now, not every one of them. We have the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, they were captive from Jerusalem, taken back to Babylon. But for the most part, the people had horrible canvases, and God says, I want a blank canvas. Much the same way, we go back to the Old Testament, the Israelites, uh, Moses led them out of Israel to Mount Sinai, and from there, he took them to the southern area of the land of Canaan. And God said, okay, go search the land out. We're going to have you march in. We're going to have you conquer the land. The people said, no way. We're, we're like grasshoppers. They're giants. And so what did God do? He says, okay, I want a clean canvas. I can't work with you. I want a clean canvas. So for the next 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness till that generation died off, and God got clean canvases. Same thing was happening now. People said, I won't obey you. God said, fine. I'm going to start with a clean canvas. We go to Isaiah chapter 64. We go to verse 8. Here's another way of looking at this. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I'm assuming we've all seen a potter's wheel. Now, back in those days, the potter's wheel would have been a big wheel on top with a, with a shaft axle going through it and another wheel on bottom. And the, the potter would turn the wheel with his feet. Now, today we've got motorized. But the potter takes clay, softens it up to the consistency that the potter wants it, puts it on the potter's wheel, the spinning wheel, and starts turning it with his feet. And then he starts shaping it into a cup or a pot or whatever it might be. But you know, sometimes something's wrong with the clay. It doesn't want to form right. So he takes it off, scrunches it all up, and has to reshape or make it into a big ball of mush again or whatever you want to call it until he gets the consistency. Then he starts over and does it again. And this is how it is in our lives. We are the clay, as Isaiah is saying. And he's saying that, you know, sometimes we don't like what God's making out of us. God starts to shape us. We say, wait a minute, I don't like that. So we try to do our own thing. And God says, okay, let's start over. Clump. Mushes the clay, mushes us back together. It hurts. We don't like it when God does that to us. But God starts again. And there again, if we're just pliable enough, we let him work in our lives. And we let him shape us into a masterpiece of what he wants us to be. Not what we want to be. And God has a, has a different plan for each of us. He doesn't want all of us the same. God loves variety. God loves us in every area. You know, we, we're not all preachers. We're not all factory workers. We're not all farmers. We're not all doctors. We're not all lawyers. No, God wants, wants different things. And so God shapes and forms us into his masterpiece. But yet, allows us in all different professions, allows us in different areas of life. We go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, as God was calling Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now think about this. Jeremiah is in his mother's womb. Not a, not a fetus, not a fleshly mass, a child. A child of God in the womb, not something to be aborted. And God said, Jeremiah, I saw you when you were in your mother's womb. And I saw what I could make of you. And today I'm calling you. What did God want? A blank canvas of Jeremiah. And God said, now I'm going to start painting my masterpiece. 
And Jeremiah was just a young man. And God started painting. So our point is, God wants us as blank canvases so he can paint his masterpieces. We want to change this a little bit. God wants, cross out us. Put your name in there. God wants Kenny as a blank masterpiece so he can paint his masterpiece. Put your own name on there. Personalize this. God wants each of us as a blank canvas. We go back to this story of Jesus and this now formerly demon-possessed man. Jesus healed the man. Cast the demon out of him. The, the city dump is now laying bloated in the Sea of Galilee. What a mess those people had to clean up to pull their deities out of the Sea of Galilee and do something. Can you imagine the stench that would be over the next month? They had nothing to, to take care of. That, that had to bury them. 2,000 hogs would have been a big job to bury And so what these people wanted as they were coming and they were seeing what was going on, they said, Jesus, go away. They pleaded with him, Jesus, just just leave us. Go away. We don't want you here. They were terrified. They were scared. And Jesus had this power over their deities. Get out of here, Jesus. And so as Jesus was getting back in the boat, this formerly demon-possessed man said, Jesus, I'm coming with you. And Jesus says, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. The man begged Jesus, please let me go with you. Doesn't that make sense? Jesus wouldn't let him. See, Jesus had just wiped his canvas clean. Now this man wants to start painting. Jesus said, that's not the painting I want. We go to Mark chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus did not let him but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Look at the simplicity of this. Jesus didn't tell him, go to the synagogue, talk to the priest and get an education. Jesus didn't tell him, go to the temple in Jerusalem, which he wouldn't be allowed in anyway, but go to the master teachers and get an education from them, then come back and be a preacher. No, Jesus didn't say any of that. Look at this. Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. He couldn't go home to his friends. He didn't have any. Might have had family. Would they take him back? Who knows? Can you imagine what terror he had produced on his family? Easy for you and me to say, yeah, they need to take him back. Not if he had a used me as to say he was my dad and he had, he had terribly, that, that's hard. That's hard to personalize that and to, and to accept this man. But yet Jesus said, you're not coming with me. You go back to your people and you tell them what has happened in you. So, he went home. We go to, well, let's, let's, go, let's go back. God wants us as blank canvases. Let's go back to that point. God wants us as blank canvases so he can paint his masterpieces. God wants to start with a clean canvas. He wants to start all over again. He doesn't want to cover up our mess. You know, there, there's, I've, I've seen some artists that uh, they, they've got this painting or they've you know, got a uh, museum and when they discovered that underneath the outside painting, there's, there's a masterpiece underneath it. Somebody had painted over it. But I assume that most artists want their own clean canvases. And so God wants us as a clean canvas. God, God doesn't want us messing it up. You know, what our problem is, we've got a clean canvas. And we let God start to paint. And then we say, well, God... I want to add some brushes to that. So we get our paintbrush out and we start, we start do, dabbling in it. And God says, wait a minute, I'm, I'm doing a masterpiece here. Stop messing it up. Or we say, well, you know, God, and I've seen this before. A person submits to God, they come, to, they're, they're a Christian, they're all excited, they're letting God make their masterpiece. And all at once they say, you know what, I don't like what's going on here. And they just, they grab the paintbrush and they totally repaint the picture. 
and is something that is not godly at all. And God lost him. Jesus cleaned this guy's canvas. And with each stroke of Jesus painting the canvas, this guy's canvas was going to turn into a masterpiece. And Jesus told him, he said, I've got a better plan for you. Don't come with me. I've got a better plan for you. You stay here. This is the masterpiece that I want of you. Now we go to Mark chapter 5, verse 20. Did the man do it? So the man went home and began to tell them in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Wait a minute. There's no more screams coming from the cemetery at night. Wow. This is the guy? This is the guy that Luke says was naked. They couldn't keep clothes on him. And now he's clothed and sane here. It's amazing. Did he continue? Did he actually carry this out? Yeah, well, if you go to Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37, Jesus went back to this area. And guess what? When he, when he landed, they brought people to him to be healed. See, this man did his job. He did exactly what God wanted him to do, what Jesus told him to do. And they started coming to him because they'd heard of him and they saw what God has done. See, God wants us as blank canvases. Wants us, his masterpiece. Okay, one more quick point. God wants us, his masterpiece, where everyone can see us. God wants us, his masterpiece, where everyone can see us. God wants everyone to see his painting. I mean, we, we don't take a masterpiece and hang it in our house and don't let anybody see it. God wants you and I out where everyone can see us. So does God want us to come to church? Yes. God wants us at church because at church is where we come as a body and we glorify God. And we do this as a unit. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's, the church is also a place where we can recharge our batteries. We get down and out. We come to church. We get excited again, hopefully. And we get teaching. And so we, we're ready to go out another week. We come to church and the church is a hospital. The church is a place where we need healing. And some of us come heartbroken and hurt. And others of us come full of joy and, and we're able to help those that are hurt. Maybe we've got needs. And you know, one thing the church is not good at is letting everyone know what needs we've got. We tend to be selfish. We tend to hold up in ourselves. But no, the church is the body. It's where we, we come together to help each other out. Let me ask you this. If this, imagine now this is a masterpiece. God has painted it. Unbelievable masterpiece. What would happen if I took this home, let's say this is me, and I hang it in the house, and on Sunday morning, I take it off the wall, I put it in my car, and I come to church, and when I get to church, we all hang our masterpieces on the walls so we can look at each other's masterpiece. Then when church is over, we take our masterpiece back, we put it in the car, Take it back home and we hang it in the closet. So the only ones that sees the masterpiece is Christians, the church. Is that what God wants? No. God wants our masterpiece out where everyone can see us. In other words, we take the masterpiece, us, and we are the masterpiece wherever we are. When I was much younger... I had a, a decision to make, a life decision. I have no clue what it was right now, but I remember going to our minister and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm tossing around. I don't know which way to go. I wish God would just tell me what he wants of me. And the minister said, well, maybe God doesn't care. Now, he, he didn't mean that as though God didn't care at all. What he meant was God doesn't care which way you go. Both were honorable. He said, either way, let your light shine for Jesus. And maybe God doesn't care which way you go. In other words, be the masterpiece. And God won't care what you do. This is why I say that God needs us in different professions. God needs us everywhere. You know, one of the problems of the church is we support somebody going to Bible college. Well, maybe we need to start supporting people that go to other areas of education also. Let me ask you this. If I take this as a masterpiece, where does it look best? Here? 
or, or, or maybe, maybe right here in the middle. Maybe, maybe it looks best over here. God doesn't care. God doesn't care. What God cares is that we are the masterpiece. Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, let's be the masterpiece. Let's submit to Him. Father in heaven, Submission is so difficult because we want to do it our way. And we get these things in our minds sometimes. Well, God, God wants this of me, but yet then we go there and we say, oh, that, no, that wasn't it. And that's not submission. Father, I've seen people go to Bible college. God called me here. And then they get there. and Man, this is hard. I, uh, I think I'll quit. No, no, no. If you called us to something, then you want us to stick with it. But really, God, wherever we go, whatever we do, let's let you paint the masterpiece. Let, let us be submissive to you. Let us bow to you. And let you create the masterpiece, not us, you. Allow us to work with you. Father, there's, there's people hurting in the congregation. And they need your help with their masterpiece and help us to surround them and be the church to them, the hospital. Go with us, Father, wherever we are, as we submit to you. Paint your masterpiece in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website, rosscupchurch.org, and that's spelled R-O-U-S-C-U-L-P church.org. You can find information there on how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you or talk with you and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.